Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Kessler and I am on the marketing team here at Inception and I am thrilled to be moderating this panel discussion today on five strategies for surviving peak season 2021. So it is no secret that rates are already high and businesses of all sizes are struggling to find capacity and it's already August. So today we're here to help you navigate that. Um, just to kind of give you a look at what we're going to be chatting through today. We're going to be going over really just a high level view of the supply chain and what you can expect across the freight market. We're going to be talking about how you can prepare and, and what to expect specifically as our panelists outline uh, different aspects of your business that you should be paying attention to. And then there will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar today for you to ask questions. So if, if any questions come out up throughout the webinar today, please feel free to input them in the question section of your, of your chat and we will get those and hold those for the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our panelists to us. Um, we have three incredible experts with us today, for, all from Inception. We have Brooke Carter, who is our Executive Vice President of Corporate Development and Strategy. We have TJ Clayton, who is our VP of Logistics. And we have Enrique Porto, who is our VP of International Logistics. And I am going to turn it over to them just to explain a little bit about you know, their background in the supply chain and what they do at Inception. Uh, so TJ, can you kick us off today, please? I would be happy to. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everybody. My name is TJ Clayton. I am the Vice President of Logistics, and my specific focus here is on the domestic logistics. Um, and we manage here in a multimodal environment at, at Inception, LTL parcel, full truck load, um, and uh, light managed trance um, through some of our baseline technology. Um, I'm a 25-year veteran of uh, transportation, um, spent about 18 years of that um, in the LTL space. And the last 10 years prior to my involvement here at Inception, uh, building freight brokerages. Um, so very happy to be with you guys today and look forward to it. Thanks, TJ. Brooke, how about you? Hey guys, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be on this panel with my two Inception brothers who are geniuses at this stuff. Um, I thought I was an expert at logistics until I met them. So, uh, but, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My background is primarily in sales and marketing. Um, I worked for about a decade with one of the leading of the world's leading transportation providers. And I basically worked over that decade in various commercial roles um, with all types of customers from the smallest of the small to the largest. And um, currently at Inception, I am working on some exciting things. I'm working alongside my brilliant team so basically find new ways to connect our customers with a new audience of customers um, without them having to lift a finger. And that is the Inception Marketplace. Super excited. I could talk about it a lot, but um, we'll save that for another webinar. Uh, but yeah, uh, check us out. We're, we're um, doing big things. Thank you, Brooke. And Enrique. Uh, sure. Thank you, Sarah. But how do you follow the steps of Brooke and TJ? It's a hard job. So uh, as, you, as, you, as you can see, my name is Enrique Porto. I am the Vice President of International Logistics here at Inception. And in that role and alongside a fantastic team of logistics professional that I have the honor of leading, um, our mission is to help our Inception's partners ship internationally more efficiently, whether this is to their end customers or by helping them uh, import raw materials for their production. Prior to joining an exception, I, I worked for over 15 years in international freight forwarding, and my most recent position was with XPO Logistics as uh, their direction of, uh, director of sales and operations, um, managing multiple branches within their uh, global forwarding business unit. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, as you can see, we have uh, some some incredible expertise across a variety of different areas today. So we are we're thrilled to dig in and get started to share what's happening this peak season. Before we kick off, though, we want to hear from you. So we're going to launch a poll here in just a second, just to kind of hear what's on your mind in terms of peak season. So you will see that on your screen in just a moment. It'll be up for about 30 seconds. And if you can just select one of those options, um, question is, what are you most concerned about this peak season? 
finding capacity, transportation costs, extended transit times, or having enough inventory to meet consumer demand. All right, responses are trickling in. We have about 20 seconds left here. And this is all anonymous, just so you know. So we can't see what who's saying what, but feel free to share if you'd like. All right, and that poll will close in just a second. You'll be able to see the results here. All right. So it looks like, yeah, transportation costs make sense. Almost half of you saying that's a huge concern this year. And that makes sense because it's 30 August and we're seeing uh, a lot of price surging. Actually, prices really just haven't gone down in a while. Finding capacity, extended transit times, and then having enough inventory is maybe uh, a little bit at the bottom of the list, but still a concern. So we are going to touch on all of that today. Thank you all so much for weighing in. Um, so yeah, just to kick it off on that note, it seems like everyone is is very aware that rates are high across all modes right now. And it's hard to find capacity, but they might not know why. Um, obviously, we're coming off of a really challenging couple of years and you know we've heard the word unprecedented probably more times in the last two years than we've ever wanted to hear in our lives but there's been a lot of <laughs> unprecedented activity in the supply chain so tj i'm curious if you could kick us off by just giving us a rundown of what's actually happening in the freight market right now what do shippers need to know and why are why are they already experiencing um such a capacity shortage across the supply chain sure be happy to and uh, my favorite uh, description of of what's going on in the freight market right now is simply bananas is uh, is the way that I would put it. But um, but on a serious note, um, you know, capacity we we've seen an exacerbation of a number of issues um, that are trying to be addressed through a number of ways. Um, so I'll start off and sound like a broken record by saying that you know capacity is obviously um, light. Um, demand is high. Um, logistics and transportation in the U.S. is kind of the the, the quintessential case of supply demand economics. Uh, demand is super high. Uh, capacity is uh, somewhat fixed, and prices are going up. So um, there's a number of things you can think about, and why is that happening? Um, the most obvious is often talked about, which is driver shortage. Um, and it's an interesting thing, driver shortage, and and really how you look at it if you peel the onion. Um, what we're short on are long haul drivers. Um, there's no shortage of people who can drive equipment. Um, but, you know, over the last several, maybe five to 10 years, long haul drivers are becoming quite scarce. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Short haul, um, trucking companies regionalizing and simply not wanting to burden the expense of volatile fuel markets, as well as, um, last mile, the explosion of last mile services in the United States as a result of e-com and that was just propelled forward by the pandemic. Um, you know, last mile is uh, expected to run at about a 16% CAGR over the next five years and add an extra $60 billion to the industry. So, um, there's money to be made if you're a driver in the last mile. Um, so from that perspective, um, driver shortage is probably the number one reason for capacity, but there's a couple of other reasons. And, you know, mode escalation is another as well as positioning. Um, you have to just think about geographically where you are. If you're in Des Moines, Iowa, you may not suffer from capacity shortage like you would in Los Angeles or Savannah, Georgia. So um, positioning and where you are, you're going to have a different perspective on capacity available to you today. Um, but the issue with positioning is that trucks are just moving in sporadic nature is anything that might have been some semblance of normality with peak season and you know whether it's uh produce season and just the way that trucks and you know the way they move around the country throughout the season it's completely disrupted um a lot of that that i'm sure enrique is going to enlighten us on and how the international markets are affecting that um the last would simply be mode escalation um parcel is tapped out they are already at capacity. Uh, more freight from parcels being pushed into LTL. Um, people are breaking down full truckloads and trying to push them into LTL. So LTL is sitting in the middle right now, um, ultimately getting to pick and choose what freight they want to haul and what they don't. Um, and by all accounts, they are capped out from a capacity perspective as well. Um, and heavy duty orders for trucks and trailers, they simply can't make them fast enough. So 
Um, there's a number of reasons for capacity shortage and what's going on in the in the market right now, but um, but ultimately, um, you know, that's uh, those are the things that are happening in the market today. Yeah, thank you, TJ. Yeah, and and like you said, I know Enrique can speak to this for sure. Uh, just the international disruptions that we've seen. I mean, the supply chain kind of stole the stage uh, earlier this this year with so many different disruptions and people who don't even pay attention to the supply chain usually all of a sudden we're a captive audience um, as headlines were talking all about the supply chain. So Enrique, if you can enlighten us a little bit more, uh, obviously, you know, TJ kind of caught us up to speed on, okay, here's what's happening now, but how did we get here and, and why is it this bad? Uh, and along with that, a lot of experts have really called the last year a perpetual peak season. We never really dipped between last peak season and this season. So if you can help us understand from that international perspective too, how is it that it got this bad in the last year? Sure, so, so TJ used uh, the term bananas. I'm gonna use perfect storm. Uh, and, and it's a perfect storm that um, was started primarily and, and being affected primarily by COVID, but there's other things that, that happen as well outside of COVID. So, um, and I'll, I'll speak to it primarily from a U.S. standpoint, because um, that's where we are right now and probably where most of our um, people joining on the webinar are, but, but it also applies to other regions of the world and, and probably the Western Hemisphere as well. So COVID originates in Asia, uh, the factory of the world. Um, they, they started feeling the effects first and they reacted first to it. And uh, one of the, the, the ways they reacted to it from an, in, from an industry standpoint and from a production standpoint, they, they shut down. They shut down operations, which uh, kind of kicked off the, the, the perfect storm. Uh, delays, pauses in production, uh, and essentially stops the world or global commerce for a while. Um, and then the same starts happening in the United States. So, uh, we, the United States begins um, countering measure again, counting, enforcing countering measures against COVID, and they shut down uh, as well. Um, then the Asian countries begin reopening quicker uh, than the United States. They start ramping up production and or going back to, to normal levels of production, so trying to achieve normal levels of production, and they start exporting to the United States. But again, the United States did not uh, recover at the same pace. So imports start piling up. It's a short transit time from an ocean freight standpoint uh, between Asia and the United States, just call it two weeks. So imports start piling up other ports. You, you would see the famous pictures of uh, dozens of uh, container ships just parked outside of the uh, California ports. Um, so that, that started, started the mess. Um, when U.S. starts uh, reopening, imports climb significantly, exponentially. They, as the U.S. rushed to replenish uh, inventory, um, so they, so again, imports begin piling up, adding to congestion, and that import frenzy does not stop uh, after the 2020 holidays. So again, everything continues building up. To add to the madness. Um, the equipment or container manufacturing industry was also hit by COVID. So all the delays we talked about also affected the factories who actually make uh, containers, ocean containers. So um, in addition to that, because of all the issues, the uh, it's taking longer turn, my apologies for my dog, uh, it's taking longer for those containers to be reutilized. So it makes it harder and longer for that unit to be released and be delivered to the next user. Uh, and then if that, was, that wasn't enough, we had a 1,300-foot 13, uh, vessel obstructing the Suez Canal, which is one of the world's busiest routes. Uh, and that impacted significantly the trade between Asia, Europe, uh, and the Middle East. Um, so again, it's it's one thing after the other. And then COVID again, uh, Yantian uh, 
port closure, one of the world's busiest ports. Uh, Ningbo, one of the Ningbo container terminals in, in China uh, has been closed for probably a, a, about a week now, which is the, the world's third busiest port. So again, if you, if you go back through all of those things, um, turns out to be a perfect storm severely impacting the the, the world uh, the world commerce yeah absolutely i mean that was a great summary i mean the ever given became a household name when the suez catastrophe happened i mean everyone was was tracking that and i think that's maybe when consumers started to realize oh this might this might affect me as the end consumer <laughs> uh which mm -hmm. we'll get into a little bit more um something we talked about i heard you touch on earlier tj is just the impact of e-commerce as well uh, on on all of these imports. And, and Brooke, I know that's something that you have a lot of expertise around. Can you just speak to that a little bit more in terms of how did e-commerce change the game this time around? Yeah, absolutely. And I, first of all, Enrique, I'm waiting for my dogs to bark. I, I mean, they're being quiet now, so <laughs> you just wait. It's not going to be you only. Uh, but, you know, back to the, the point that you made earlier, Sarah, of the perpetual peak season, when you think about when COVID started um, and we were, I mean, it had started, but it came to the U.S. Uh, March 2020, um, there was this massive, you know, demand and the shipping levels were super high. And at the time, I think those in the industry thought, oh, it'll it'll come down, like, the bottom will fall out and it'll even out and we won't, you know, we won't have to worry about capacity. Well, it never stopped. It continued to climb over 2020 um, and the, to the point that 27.6% was the growth in 2020 on uh, global e-commerce sales. Um, and then when you think about from March, you know, to the traditional peak season. So when I started in 2011 uh, working in logistics, peak season was literally Thanksgiving through maybe the first week of January to allow for returns. And now we have been in peak season, as my buddy TJ says, for like ever. It, it, it has not stopped. There has not been any sort of delay um, and capacity remains strained. But as it relates to e-commerce, um, think about yourself. Think about how much you order online now versus you know, how much you used to. For me, I used to, you know, kind of 50-50, shop in stores, shop online. Now I'm almost exclusively buying online or buying online and picking up in store. So when you think about that shift in buying behavior, it's changing the games for shippers, small and large. And again, thinking about ourselves, consumer goods spending is way up and it's becoming more and more challenging for um, retailers, to keep up with the demand. I'm sure some of you have dealt with that. Um, I'm still waiting on some furniture. Hopefully I get it before the end of 2021. But um, so it's it's not gonna stop anytime soon. Uh, the demand is super high. And uh, just to kind of give you guys um, some perspective for 2021, um, the expected growth rate of global e-commerce will be 14.3% bringing uh, the global e-commerce sales to 4.891 trillion. Yes, trillion with a T. So that's a lot. And that industry continues to grow. We expect it to continue to be double digits um, through 2022. Um, and also the, the U.S. parcel market, um, we all know it's dominated by three major carriers, one of which I used to work for. That demand will continue to exceed uh, carrier capacity by at least 5 million parcels a day this peak season. So, I mean, it's it's bananas, it's a perfect storm, it's unprecedented, it's all that. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I heard someone talking about it, making a comparison. It's kind of like, you know, if you, if you go to the airport to get on your flight and your flight gets canceled, they need to put you on another flight, but the flights you want to get on are already full. And so mm -hmm. you have to wait for a seat to open up. And and I feel like that, that might be the best way um, for people outside the supply chain to really understand it is that you know when when there's this overflow when there's not enough room for the things that were already scheduled um it just keeps backing up um so yeah thank you thank you all for getting into just kind of some context for where we are how we got here and why um so just digging into a little bit about what specifically shippers are going to encounter 
this season. Um, we've talked about some of the challenges. I mean, you know, we had that poll at the beginning, so it seems like people on this call are already aware of some of the challenges. What are some uh, specifics that they can expect to see? Uh, TJ, anything on your mind in terms of just over the road and domestic shipping? Yeah, um, and I think we're already seeing some of it. Um, and, you know, we're, we've all witnessed a change in the, the e-commerce market with respect to parcel. Um, and transit times, and that's a good analogy or, or thought to speak to transit times. Transit times overall from uh, point of distribution to final customer, be it B or a B to C, um, is going to extend. Um, it's taking longer to get line haul sets done. I spoke with uh, an LTL colleague the other day, and data is keen today in, in all things, um, not just logistics. Um, and they know. They're looking at customers and, and suggesting, you know, I mean, your rates are going up because we spend an average of 28 minutes to get two delivers, you know, two pounds delivered on average every day. So, so from that perspective, um, transit times are going up. Um, the driver shortage and the driver jobs that are open and not filled um, is capacity and trucks that aren't delivering loads. Um, you know, a couple of other things, um, you know, to think about um, along with transit times is, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, if you're a JIT shipper, that kind of thing, um, your product planning, um, your raw material buying, those types of things. Um, you've got to think about that. And then I would suggest you add, um, you know, maybe a 10 to 20 percent uh, increase in transit expectation on your freight. 10 to 20 percent. All right. Yeah, quite a bit and definitely something for, for people to keep in mind. Thanks for sharing that, TJ. Um, what about, you know, what about in in that e-commerce and that, that parcel world? I know really everyone's mentioned the impact of that on other modes. Um, Brooke, is there anything in that regard that's happening that, that you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I think TJ uh, was brilliant in summarizing sort of the issue with transit times, but you also want to think about how the big guys, the large e-commerce players are using the same carriers that the small and medium businesses are. So there is a race for capacity. Now, I, I do believe that um, the large carrier, the large um, parcel carriers have adapted and understand that, hey, we got to control this capacity to make sure that we take care of our SMBs. Um, and with that, you know, there's more control on by the day how much volume some of these large guys can ship. So I, I do think they're looking out for, you know, the small and medium businesses because that business is important. Um, but just keep in mind, everybody's sort of trying to use the same capacity and it's limited. Um, you know, there'll be parcel uh, peak surcharges for sure, and that'll continue to impact the high volume shippers, um, again, in an attempt to help out the SMBs. And um, like TJ mentioned earlier, all the parcel and FTL volume surplus is moving over to LTL, and, you know, it's, it's just booming all over the place. Um, and I would just say lastly, like I mentioned before, inventory levels continue to be super low, and, and I think we expect that to be the case for the rest of the year in early 2022. So just some things to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, the inventory to sales ratio has been at record low recently. I think it was just hovering right around one the last time I checked. And I mean, really that's saying that for every sale that they make, you know, companies only have one item of inventory in stock. Yeah, it's kind right. of close all across the supply chain. Um, so knowing that, lest we are creating more panic as we are talking about all of these <laughs> things that are happening across <laughs> the supply chain, we do have some strategies for you, so stick around. Um, so yeah, just kind of knowing that that is what, what shippers are facing um, across all industries, uh, all industry verticals, across you know every geography, this is kind of what they're up against. What is within the power of shippers this peak season? What what can they do to proactively safeguard their businesses uh, amid, amidst so much volatility? Uh, Enrique, what can they do from an international perspective? Because it sounds like that's where you know a lot of that backlog is coming from to begin with. Yeah. So unfortunately, there's there's not a magic formula or or magic wand to to solve some of these issues. But but there are some alternatives, and and I would sum that up in in terms of making your supply chain more flexible and and start making plans to do that 
right now um, in anticipation to to kind of the frenzy and, and as Brooke, Brooke and TJ mentioned we're already in peak but it's probably going to get worse a lot worse so again make your supply chain and your transportation solutions uh, or your operation more flexible and, and you can do that by by shifting some of the the ways that you've been doing uh, or handling those in the past. Number one, think about transloading. So it, again, uh, with, with the US focus, if you are uh, located in the Midwest, for example, and in, in you know, traditional uh, ocean transportation from overseas comes into the US West Coast or the US East Coast, and then it's put on a rail uh, and you know ends up in Kansas City or Chicago or wherever it may be, um, that you're seeing a lot of delays at ports and on the rails. Uh, so start thinking uh, about a transloading solution. So terminate your shipments at those ports uh, and then transload uh, your product into uh, into a regular truck uh, to have those delivered uh, directly to your dock. Um, so that could be one. Uh, start thinking of alternative routes. Uh, routes, I'm sorry. So again, uh, with the same example, the Midwest, you're, you're typically used to Asia, into the West Coast and, and into the into the, the Midwest. Um, Mexico has been an attractive solution for some of our partners. We are helping uh, some of our partners with that solution via Mexico that, that essentially shaves off uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 days on uh, to the Midwest. So, um, I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's significant, significant. So, um, and what we're doing, what we're helping some of our partners is routing their their ocean freight through Mexico and then transloading at Mexico, helping the customers with cross-border and then into the United States. So if, if that alternate uh, alternative route is something that uh, our uh, viewers are interested, interested, please feel free to reach out. We'd, we'd love to have a conversation about it. Uh, and then last but definitely not least, mode conversion. So the, the and, and um, specific example of mode conversion would be ocean to air. Um, so traditionally, before this container Armageddon uh, happened, uh, the the difference between between ocean freight and air freight was was uh, significant, right? Uh, but as you showed in, in an earlier slide, container rates uh, have went up uh, fourfold, uh, to say the least, and, and even even more on some routes. Uh, so the difference between ocean freight and air freight is not as significant as it as it. Uh, should, as it was in the past, but transit times are significantly shorter. So if there's an opportunity for you to start considering um, these conversions, uh, running the analysis right now, um, it, 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 we would, Inception would love to help, um, but it's it, it's time to that you prepare for that, at least explore the, the, the possibility of, of um, turning into some of these strategies. Yeah, and it almost sounds like what you're talking about. You know, I, I know when we did the poll in the beginning, a, a lot of people were ex expressing a concern over the rates. It's going to be expensive, but kind of what you're speaking to is, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna pay a lot of money for it, might as well make it sure it gets there on time, right? Like the the it's not it's not uh, as much of a leap to go to air freight for motion, from what you're saying. And so, you know, if, if there's going to be that expense, at least have the guarantee that you're not also going to risk more delays. Um, yeah, really helpful. Thank you so much, Enrique. Um, what about on the domestic side, TJ? Yeah, um, you know, and thanks, Enrique. That was that was fantastic. Um, and on the domestic side, as I'm sitting here listening to you and thinking about it, I mean, I've really there's to me about three simple things from a domestic logistics perspective um, that I think you should always do um, as a shipper. Um, one, don't be a stranger. Um, if you have an account manager, an account executive knocking on your door right now, you should talk to them. If they're, look, if they're knocking on your door looking for freight, they have capacity of some sort. There's no reason not to engage in the conversation. Um, if you're single sourced with a specific provider, um, I would look hard at that because that's too many eggs in a basket kind of thing. Um, those are simple, logical things, but uh, they're often overlooked. Um, you know, logistics and transportation, unfortunately, just a cost center for many businesses. Um, and we're just simply trying to drive cost. 
Um, but what is the cost of an upset customer? What is the cost of losing a, a legacy customer because of service? Things of that nature. You just got to make sure that you're looking in, a, in, a, in that way about the business. But um, I would also think about it looking at multimodal providers. If you're an SMB type shipper, you've got multiple modes, but you just don't have a lot of density. Um, bundle your freight. Put yourself in a position of leverage. Um, you know, and, and try to negotiate with a multimodal provider that can handle multiple modes for you. Um, uh, uh, another one would be um, explore non-traditional alternatives to LTL. Uh, the forwarding network is vast. They don't have uh, the, the hub and spoke model of LTL, but um, they have access to as many trucks um, and service providers at a local and national level. Um, so in many ways, Think about things like that. Regional parcel providers. Um, find out if they're right for your business, depending on where you are. Um, and the last I would say is you need to look at logistics and how does the logistics industry view you as a partner or a, or, or a customer. Um, and what I would say is always ask yourself, am I a preferred shipper to my vendors? Um, do you have a dwell time issue at your facility? Um, you know, do you guys have any sort of driver amenities if you're a big truckload shipper? Um, do you allow parking? Parking is a huge issue for over-the-road drivers right now. Um, be amenable to the truck driver. Um, be a location where those guys want to come. Carriers have a wide variety of choice today. It is a carrier's market on where to pick up and what not to pick up. Um, how cleanly they can get in and out of your facilities often determines price. Um, time is money in the world of trucking. If the wheels don't turn, revenues aren't generating. Um, dwell time is a huge issue. Driver sentiment is another. Um, be kind to your driver. Be a preferred shipper. So those are those are three tips that, that I would always encourage a shipper if I was talking to them to make sure that you're focused on those things. Um, those little things can pay dividends for you in the long run. Yeah, that's great, TJ. I really appreciate those options, especially because, you know, when, when you think of a lot of those, it, it's not necessarily an additional expense to take those on, right? Um, you're it's about kind of building those relationships, increasing your network, and just really looking for opportunities to to partner with carriers who uh, are able to fulfill what you need them to fulfill and to keep your business moving. Uh, that's yeah, that's awesome. Um, so obviously, you know, we we've talked a lot about logistics and transportation, and that's kind of you know the focus of of a lot of what we're talking about today, but. Those are not the only sectors of of business that will be impacted this peak season. I mean, you know, I, I know we've talked about inventory, and there's just several other considerations, um, especially for you know small and medium sized businesses, where maybe some of those same people are are making a lot of those decisions. So thinking beyond the supply chain a little bit, what other facets of business do companies need to be thinking about, Brooke? And what are some other strategies that they can really take on that or maybe a little bit outside of the supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but before I answer that, I gotta say, didn't I tell you guys that these two guys were geniuses? Like, I'm <laughs> like, I wish I had been on this webinar a few years ago. <laughs> but um, no, seriously, I think there's a lot of facets to think about outside of sort of just the supply chain. I would say number one, first and foremost, you know, whether you're a large shipper or small shipper, there's an experience that you want to provide your customers. So you want to make sure that that experience stays the same during peak season and that, you know, your customers aren't experiencing horrible delays. They don't know where their package is, which is going to make all these calls come to, you know, your customer support team. So, you know, put energy into your building up your customer support team, ensuring that they're trained, it's, it's properly staffed. And they're ready to manage the customer's expectations and field inquiries. And, you know, it's it's pretty clear to the customer that, okay, if I call this company, I'm going to be taken care of. Um, secondly, you want to make sure your technology is up to snuff. Um, there's, there's so many different um, technology platforms out there. But you want to make sure that you're able to retrieve data so that you can further analyze and you know kind of be nimble throughout peak season uh, i think that's super important um and also you know it'll help you with customer insights and then you know planning inventory over time so i think that's critical uh let's see second or thirdly i would say selling online um i know for myself and i'm sure for my other panelists like 
you want to know when your package is coming. Um, there's nothing worse than than getting going to track a package and it says check back later. We don't know where your package is basically. So you know, make sure that you're using integrated shipping software with real time tracking. Uh, again, that will cut down on your customer support calls. Um, and also think about, you know, how to increase your profitability. You know, I, I think one thing that, that's apparent to me is, you know, a lot of businesses have reinvented themselves in COVID, um, but reinvention doesn't mean going way out of your wheelhouse. You know, focus on your core, focus on what you do well. Um, and then I would just say, lastly, um, digital marketing support. Um, this is an area that, you know, just continues to grow so much over um, the last few years. Um, but you want to make sure that you know your customers' top selling products. Are you on the right platforms to market to your customers? Social media is big. Um, I joke often with my family that Instagram gets me every time, every time, whatever their algorithm is, it works. So you want to make sure that you're marketing and you're doing the, doing all the work to connect with your customers in various ways so that you're always top of mind um, and that you're communicating with them not only about order updates but what's new. So bottom line, you need an advocate this year. Like whether you're big, whether you're small, um, you need somebody who's going to have your back. You're going to need, you know, to know that you have a go-to person um, to help you out through these issues and inception, we'd love to be that for you. Um, but you know, you need some, you need somebody who knows the market and can help you anticipate trends and problem solve. And like my brother TJ just mentioned, you know, it's gone are the days where you can single source. You really have to protect yourself, make sure that you've got options and, and that you, you can service customers in the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's so helpful, Brooke, um, and just all those aspects of, of business to think about. I think that's so important. I also love what you said about, you know, focus on your strengths um, and, and what you're good at, because a lot of what you're saying, you know, maybe this could come across as overwhelming, like, don't forget about this part of your business and this part of your business. But the benefit is you can really, you can outsource a lot of this stuff. And like you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, Inception takes care of a lot of these things. Um, our, our whole motto is, you know, we want to help people do business better. And that's really coming from this this holistic integrative approach to business in general um so tj you you've been uh, at inception the longest of all of us here and i'm curious <laughs> you know, why would you say inception is uniquely positioned you know knowing knowing the supply chain knowing the market knowing our capabilities why is inception uniquely positioned to help businesses through this peak season well our mission to do help companies do business better can be defined in a number of ways um, we're not a logistics organization. We're not uh, simply an e-com platform. We're, we're not a Fiserv or FinTech. Um, we're kind of all of those things. Um, so in the sense of helping customers do business better, find new customers, find better ways to market, um, help them digitally transform. Um, and from my perspective of it, give an opening to the marketplace um, whereby any customer can sell any level or size or quantity of product that they want um, and frictionlessly and digitally process that through logistics and to your end user and your customer um, is priceless. Um, we literally wrap up into one packaging platform um, what is typically cobbled together through two or three or four maybe potential software providers. So, um, you know, um, I, I hate to use the phrase one-stop shop, but um, but Inception, um, you know, we can check a lot of boxes um, um, for businesses of all sizes um, and how we can help them do those things. Yeah, that's awesome. And that is, you know, that really is what, what businesses need, you know, right now with so many options of uh, ways to kind of piecemeal different things together for their business. It's so helpful to just have that one platform and, and that one group of, of experts who really know every facet of business. So I so appreciate mm -hmm. all of you. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, if you're still on, stick around. And if you have any questions, you can go ahead and, and type that into our, uh, I think you'll have a little questions panel there. So if you just wanna send us a question, um, I'm actually going through some of them right now to ask our panelists. I hope um, they're all for TJ and Enrique, okay? <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. Okay, so they're coming through. So 
a couple of things while we're waiting for some of the other ones to roll in. So just so you all know, um, all of this will be available on demand. We will be posting this whole webinar, the whole recording uh, on our resource hub, and we will be sharing it on LinkedIn as well. So if you're not already, go ahead and follow us on LinkedIn. We will post it there with a little recap. Um, something else to keep in mind, if you have not read it already, we actually have a, a peak season guide. It's a little over 20 pages that kind of goes into more specifics of different you know data across mm -hmm. each mode and then some other actionable business tips which you know these these experts here on this call you know help put all of that together so just know that that's another resource that we will send you um, for attending this so look out in your inbox in the next couple of days okay so for questions let's see so the first one is actually for enrique Okay, uh, so it sounds like you're discussing a lot of um, imports for alternative routes. What about exports? Same thing. So, so same. I think some of the some of the strategies or all of the strategies apply to exports as well. And 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 good call out. My apologies for for kind of focusing on on the import side. Um, that's typically what what we see you know, in the United States with the with the trading balance, but but some of these or all of the strategies apply as well to to exports. Um, you can so I can go quickly through them, but if it, we talked about transloading, you can do the same. So if you're an exporter based in uh, again the Midwest and you typically rail to the ports on the East Coast to Savannah or or Charleston for exports. Um, try to think about staying away from from rail and 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 do and ship it uh, via a full truckload and then search for for an alternative of transloading uh, right at the port. Um, you can same thing for alternate routes if if you're typically exporting through through the through the East Coast. Uh, think about some of the ports in the Gulf or the South. Uh, I'm based in I'm based in Miami, Florida, and our our port is typically less congested than some of the other ports. So bring your stuff down down south in Florida. We'll be happy to take it. Um, and then mode conversion. It, uh, again, transit time on ocean freight and uh, ocean freight charges for exports are significantly higher. Not as much as the import side, but they're also higher. So take a look at at the opportunity uh, to convert some of that uh, into air freight. Thank you. That was great. So we just have time for a couple more. So I have two more in here that I'll uh, try to get you all before we run out of time here. Just want to respect everyone's time. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really wonderful. Um, okay. So TJ, you mentioned surcharges for peak season. Are there any dates that I should keep in mind? Yeah. Um, so in just a general way, uh, some of the parcel providers, they've already got a peak season surcharge in effect now. Um, a critical date would be to check your agreements with your providers um, and check their websites for general information. Um, the current peak season that's in effect now went into effect July 4th will run, I believe, through the end of October. Um, so right now would suggest that there's going to be a, a refactor um, in, in a number of modes uh, come mid to late October. So I would keep uh, Halloween on your calendar. Um, it might be a little spooky. Um, what's coming? Uh, what's coming through the pipe there for you? And we, we have so many different phrases to describe peak season that just came out of this whole conversation. <laughs> Blog posts for I days. Love it. <laughs> um, okay, last thing here. Okay, if I if my company does not have a dedicated supply chain manager, how would I go about something like transloading? In alternative routing. Enrique, back to you. Contact us. We can certainly help. Uh, uh, so you most many companies do not have a dedicated resource for for supply chain or transportation manager. Uh, a lot of the 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 companies we do business with with uh, today, our commerce partners, are are small and medium sized businesses and. Um, you know the the owners or the presidents or the general managers are we wearing multiple hats. That's that's everyday everyday uh, America. So we would we'd love to to help. Um, again, as I said earlier, I I am 
I am honored to lead a team of fantastic individuals that uh, would love to help you. So contact us. Um, the, I think the, the email is, uh, yeah, it's, it's right there. Shoot us a quick email. We'd, we'd love to help you. What we do through one of the services that we offer um, is uh, helping companies do business better. And that also includes logistics. So we would, we would be happy to help you with, uh, with that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Enrique. Um, and thank you everyone for your questions and for, for tuning in today. It's been a pleasure to have this conversation with the three of you, TJ, Enrique, and Brooke. Uh, and again, like Enrique said, feel free to reach out to us. You can email us at info at inception.com. And if you just put peak season in the subject line and just share a little bit of information within the email, um, we will contact you for a, a free peak season consultation. Everything we do is, um, you know, as TJ was saying, we have a wide range of solutions and capabilities, but everything we do in terms of those business solutions is very targeted to your specific needs. And so it's really about figuring out what do you need and, and how can we empower you to do business better? So thank you again so much for attending panelists. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.